Uh, this evening we're going to be looking at, um, I want to say just one verse in 2 Timothy 3, but in a certain sense we're going to be touching on just about everything that uh, Paul says in this particular chapter. 2 Timothy chapter 3, so what I'd like to do is read the uh, 17 verses of the chapter. And since this is a sermon in and of itself, I would encourage you to listen carefully because this is God's word. Paul writes to Timothy, <clears throat> but realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres oppose Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith, but they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janus and Jambres' folly was also. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening. Now again, this morning we saw Jesus cleanse the temple and we noted three things in particular. First, that Jesus was zealous for his, God's, for, well, for his Father's glory and demonstrated his zeal or his love for his Father by doing something to promote it. When he saw the temple was overrun with those that were profiteering, uh, Jesus purged the temple and threw them out. You know, that, it's interesting. We didn't look at this particular application, but just think about the people today who seek to profit from Christianity. They're all over the, the media, as it were. The Lord hates that. He wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, we saw that he, Jesus, secondly, had the right to cleanse the temple because of who he was or who he is. He is the Son of God. He is the owner of the temple. And so he was able to do something, of course, which not everybody could do. He had the right to throw them out of his house. And we saw, thirdly, that he exercised his zeal perfectly according to his Father's will. And as we saw, there's many things that shape that, but Jesus always applied it just perfectly to the situation. Now from this, we took away three principles, that if we love Jesus and we love his Father, we also will stand up for their honor. The more we love them, the more we will stand up for them. Secondly, that we will do this according to the position that the Lord gives to us and the opportunities that he gives to us. We don't have his authority, but we do have authority in certain areas, the authority that he has given to us, whether we have a position in government, in our families, or in the church. And of course, there is also that authority that comes basically from the command that he gives to us in the church and in society. 
to look out for our brothers and our sisters in Christ and to do good to all men, uh, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And then thirdly, we saw that we will, if we know the Lord, uh, want to temper our zeal with grace according to the situation, again, as our Lord Jesus did. We see in Scripture that Jesus required more of those who knew more and who experienced more, but was more patient and gracious with those who knew less and experienced less. And Paul, in particular, exhorts us, especially when we're dealing with believers, to make sure that we deal with one another gently. Galatians 6, verses 1 through 2. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, I think that middle section reminds us that it's only by the grace of God that we're not in their situation and that we're in the situation that we are in. Uh, and so if we would deal in, in any other way than the Lord calls us to, we're going to find ourselves very likely in a similar situation. Uh, why he says, look to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. But now what we want to note this evening is that there is a price to pay for living this kind of life, for having this kind of zeal, for standing up for Jesus. This was certainly true of Jesus when he stood up for his father. Remember, they asked him for a sign. And the sign that he gave them was the resurrection, which was still roughly three years away. Now, we know that they didn't see it, and we know that they didn't believe it, and we know that they left him alone, most likely because there were people who saw his signs and did believe, at least they believed outwardly. But we also need to recognize that it didn't stop them from working secretly to try to subvert everything that Jesus was doing, to plot his demise. It didn't override their fear that the Romans would come and take away their position uh, as Jesus becomes more and more popular. And it's true that Jesus later in his life would pay for his zeal with his own life. There is a price that has to be paid if we're going to live the life that Jesus calls us to live. Now that's what I want us to look at this evening. If you love the Lord and are zealous for his glory, if you use your position, if you use your opportunities to take a stand for him, to promote his truth, even if you do it in the most gracious way possible, you are still going to be persecuted. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And the question I believe the Lord asks us through this particular text and through this truth is this, are you willing to pay that price? That is the price that you must pay if you're going to follow Jesus Christ. There are no exceptions. So let's consider three things this evening. First of all, if you are a believer, you will live an openly godly life. Life. In other words, you will be zealous for his glory. You will stand up for the one who stood up for you. Secondly, that if you live an openly godly life, you will be persecuted. And then thirdly, there are no exceptions to this rule, um, both with regard to our need to do that if we're going to see heaven. But if we do that, we will be persecuted. So first of all, let's consider that if you are a believer, you will live an openly godly life. You will stand up for Christ. And now this certainly follows from what we saw this morning. Remember, to be a Christian, uh, what, what it means to be a Christian is, is to be like Christ. It's to be a follower of Christ. It means to imitate his example. The word Christian literally means little Christ. Now, what kind of life did Jesus live? Well, he lived a life that was openly in service to his Father for his glory. He lived as his Father called him to live. If you are a believer, if you are a true believer, if you're a Christian, that's what you're going to do. Now we also considered this morning that the blessing of the new covenant is, is God's you know, putting his, his law in your mind and writing it upon your heart by his Holy Spirit. 
giving you the power because he gives you the desire to obey it. If you have the Spirit of God, if you have him living within you, if his law is written on your hearts, then it will show itself in your life. You will live an openly godly life. I think the third reason that I would offer is something that really doesn't even need to be said, and that is, obviously, this is what God commands you to do, to live in this way. We saw the example of Jesus, but he commands us directly to do precisely what Jesus did. We read in Ephesians 5, verses 8 through 12, what Paul writes to the Ephesians. He says, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. In other words, live like children of the light. So what's that like? For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. What else does it include? Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And of course, the, down, or the opposite side of that is, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even, or even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. And of course, our Lord says precisely the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount when he says in Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The Lord commands you to live that kind of life, to live as a Christian openly. So if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of his Holy Spirit working within you, you will want to obey him. You will want to submit to his command. You will want to follow his example. And so you will live an openly godly life. You will practice righteousness. Uh, you know, John reminds us in 1 John 3, verses 7 through 10, that this is the only practical, visible difference between the believer and the unbeliever is that one lives a righteous life and the other does not. John writes, little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil, to destroy it in your life so that you would live a godly life. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin or practice sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God nor the one who does not love his brother. Again, this is how the world knows that we belong to Jesus Christ is because we live this way. And John tells us that if we are his, we will in fact live this way. We will practice righteousness. Now what does it mean to practice righteousness? Well, in short, it means that you will live according to a higher standard than the standard the world lives by. You will live according to the word of God. That's what Paul was reminding Timothy in, our con in the context of our passage in verses 14 through 17. He's encouraging him to continue to live the kind of life that he had been accustomed to live, the way he was raised according to the will of God. He says, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. What does it mean to live a godly life? What does it mean to be openly righteous? What does it mean to practice righteousness? It means to govern your lives by God's word to live according to his will, to live according to scripture, 
to listen to his teaching, to receive his reproof and his correction, to be trained by it in righteousness so that you may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now, if you are a believer, Jesus is being formed in you by the Spirit of God. Jesus obeyed his Father's commandments. That is the image that is being formed in you. He did that to redeem you from sin to God so that you would have the power you need to obey his commandments. And he has given you his book to be your guide, to be your manual in the Christian life that you may know him Sometimes we stop there and we say, God gave us this book so that we may know him. Now that I know him, I, I have everything I need from here. I'm on my way to heaven. But, but that's not all. He gave it to you that you might know him, but also that you might know how to live the kind of life that is pleasing to him. If you are a believer, you will read this book and you will follow what it says exactly as our Lord Jesus did. Now, we won't do it as, as well as he did it, of course, but our desire will be to do it in the way that he did it as best as we possibly can by the grace of God and we will grieve over every area we fall short. So, if you are a true believer, you will live a godly life. You will live not just a godly life in secret, but you will live a godly life openly. Now, second, our text reminds us that if you live a, a godly life openly, if you live like Jesus openly, if you stand up for his, his glory, for his honor, you will be persecuted. I don't think Paul could have stated any plainer than he did in our passage again, 2 Timothy 3.12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, you do need to understand that Paul wrote this as, as an inspired apostle. This is God's word. This is truth. But you also understand that Paul wrote this from his own experience. He lived that kind of life. He experienced persecution. Again, in our passage, he says to Timothy in verses 10 and 11, Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings. Such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured. And out of them all, the Lord rescued me. Now, this was no walk in the park. I mean, if you read those particular sections of the book of Acts and you see what happened to Paul, he didn't come out unscathed by these things. Uh, he was brutal, you know, brutally beaten. Uh, he was, uh, well, on one occasion, he was actually stoned to death. Uh, he came out with a number of, of scars, what he calls the brand marks of Christ. But rather than you know, looking at that as a reason why not to serve the Lord Jesus, he actually gloried in it, that he was considered worthy to suffer. And by the way, when Paul went into this, uh, you know, Jesus told him ahead of time this was going to happen. This really didn't take him by surprise. He didn't begin to follow Jesus only uh, to find out he had to endure things he never signed up for. Jesus told him at the outset that this was what he would have to be willing to pay, that this would be the case in his life. Remember when Jesus told Ananias after the Lord met him, uh, Saul or Paul, on the way to Damascus and struck him blind. He told Ananias to go and to lay hands on Paul that he might uh, recover, that he might be healed. And Ananias was reluctant to do that because up until that time, Paul had been uh, seizing Christians, throwing them in, into prison, taking them back to Jerusalem, having them put on trial, and then watching them executed. But when he was reluctant to do this, the Lord said to him in Acts 9, verses 15 through 16, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. You see, the Lord doesn't just sort of take us by surprise. He doesn't just sort of throw us in here, promise us a walk in the park, and then suddenly drop the hammer on us, does he? The Lord tells us ahead of time what's going to happen. He told the Apostle Paul, and Jesus told his disciples precisely the same thing, that if they were going to follow him, there would be persecution 
And that would be true for every single person who would follow him. In uh, John 15, verses 18 through 21, If the world hates you, Jesus said, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you were not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you? A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If you live like Jesus, if you have something of his zeal, if you act or speak for the glory of his name, you will be persecuted. Now, why will you be persecuted? Well, it's not necessarily because you're going to do it wrong, you know, and you're just going to kind of muff things up. That's something we often think about. But it's because of the people you're going to. It's because of their disposition. Because the people of this world are not what many seem to think today, even within the church, that they're basically good, but they're basically evil, the Bible tells us. You know, Paul actually describes what people would be like in the last days, and personally, I don't believe when he's talking about the last days here, that he's talking about our days, necessarily, but he was talking about the last days prior to the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., but what was true in his day with regard to those people is equally true of the people who are in the world today. Listen to what he says in verses 2 through 5. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. You know, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3 that there is none who does good, there is not even one, there is none who seeks after God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. That is is what the people of the world are like. Now, they may not seem like they're that bad when you bump into them in your neighborhoods or in the workplace or people that you may personally know, and that is because the Lord tells us in His Word that He is restraining them. If He was to subject them to the things that provoke their sins, or if He was to remove His restraints from them, then you would see what they're really like. I mean, what are the ungodly or the people of the world really like. I mean, we haven't, I don't think we've actually ever seen it, even the worst examples, but there's plenty of them every day to look at in the newspapers and in the news reports. Uh, I mean, look at what happens to the people who are willing to stand up for the truth and who are not willing, let's say they're willing to stand against the sins of our nation or they're not willing to support the sinful acts of their neighbors. Think of what they have to endure at the hands of the people of this world. You see when that wickedness gets provoked just how wicked they really are. As a matter of fact, we don't even have to look to them to know how wicked sin is and what it can do. All we have to do is look in our own hearts because we still have something of that old man in us. And we all know what our sins make us capable of doing. Why are we going to be persecuted for living a godly life and standing up for Jesus Christ because the world hates Jesus Christ. Now, you know, the interesting thing here is I don't think Paul's actually referring to the people that are necessarily in the world. He seems to be referring to the people who are in the church. He says in verse 5 that these hold to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. And he goes on to talk about, um, well, the same things with regard to where these people actually are and they are in the household of God. He says basically they behave outwardly like Christians, they go through the right motions, they say the right things, but they really have nothing of the power of God's Spirit in them. They don't really love Him. And let me just suggest that the world in the church can persecute you just as much or more than the world that's in the world. 
That's a lesson sometimes that is surprising for us to learn, but it happens, doesn't it? We see people in the church sometimes behave even worse than the people we've seen in the world. In my own personal experience, I've, I saw that years ago. It's, it can be somewhat discouraging, but we do need to remember Jesus isn't like that. I gave you the example of what happened to my sister in the church that she was in. Should those people have behaved like that? Not at all. They should have loved her. They should have encouraged her. They should have tried to minister to her, but instead they just they cast her out. Sometimes the world is in the church, and sometimes, of course, even true believers can do things that they ought not to do. Now, the thing that highlights the evil of the world around us is why they're persecuting you. Because, I mean, what are you doing that's wrong? What is it you're actually doing? You're trying to do what Jesus did. You're trying to love God openly, and you're trying to love them. I mean, what does the Lord actually call you to be like in living like Him? What He's telling you to do is, I want you to follow my example in loving the Father and in loving your neighbor as yourself. And when He sends you out into the world, what is He sending you out to tell other people? He's sending you out to tell them that they need to stop hating God they need to stop hating their neighbor and they need to begin loving God and their neighbor that they have to be willing to turn from their hatred and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what the world is really hating is the love that God approves of and that's what makes sin to be so sinful because it is hatred of love. So the Lord tells us that if we believe in Him, that we will live an openly godly life. He tells us that if we live an openly godly life, that we will be hated, we will be persecuted. And the reason is because the world hates um, love, basically. And they're going to hate you if you try to love them in the way the Lord has called you to love them. But finally, Paul tells us there's really no exception to this rule. Again, verse 12, 2 Timothy 3. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Notice the word all. Uh, there's no exception here. If you live with a zeal for God's glory, if you openly love him and love your neighbor in the various positions that God has given to you with the various authority he's given to you as an officer of the state, as a husband, as parents, as elders or deacons in the church, as citizens of this particular city, state, country, or neighbors, in the various opportunities that God has given you in which to serve Him, as you interact with others, if you stand up for Christ, even if you do it perfectly, you will be harassed, you'll be oppressed, you'll be persecuted. Now, how do we know that? Well, Paul tells us. But again, we have the perfect example in Jesus, don't we? I mean, Jesus lived with this kind of zeal. He openly loved his father and his, his neighbor perfectly, perfectly, with just the right amount of gentleness, the right amount of love, with perfection. And yet, what happened to him? He was hated and he was murdered by his own people, by the, the world in the church. I mean, Paul just told Timothy exactly that that's what was going to happen. And it did come to happen, not just in the Jewish church, but also in the New Testament church, in the New Covenant church. When you love others in this way and you suffer for it, it's not because necessarily you're doing things imperfectly, although it's certainly possible with us that we can do it imperfectly, but it's because of the world's darkness hates the light. Jesus says in John 3 verses 19 through 20, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Which is to say that, again, even if you do it perfectly, you have to expect you're going to be hated by others. If you do what the Lord calls you to do, you will be persecuted. And the more effectively you actually do this, and the more you do it, the more you're going to be hated. Now the question is, are you willing to serve him, knowing that this is true? Are you willing to serve him on these terms? This is a very important question because the thing that 
perhaps more effectively stops us than anything else in serving the Lord, in bringing the gospel to others, is that possibility that we will be hated and persecuted. One of the reasons why we won't set ourselves apart from the world and stand up for Christ is because if we're afraid of that, that the people we know aren't going to accept us, that we're going to become the brunt of their jokes, that we're going to have to stand on the outside, we're going to be pushed to the outside, and maybe we're going to give up our chances to be something more, uh, perhaps you know, have the hope that we could be something more in this world, maybe grab a little bit of the glory for ourselves. But do you realize that's exactly the price Jesus says you must be willing to pay? If you're even going to begin to follow him, you have to be willing to pay this price. Now, Jesus said to his disciples in Luke 14, verses 26 through 35, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, let me just explain again at the outset, Jesus doesn't mean really hate them, but by, his, by our comparison of our love for him, that we wouldn't let these considerations override what Jesus calls us to do. We wouldn't, uh, as it were, compromise for the sake of holding on to these relationships in glorifying our Lord. We have to put him first. So if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And then he says, so count the cost. Which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then... None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. And by those possessions, he means not just what we have, the things we have, but the relationships we have, even our own life. We have to be willing to give our whole selves to the Lord. Therefore, salt is good, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear let him hear. And I believe Jesus means by that last statement, if we're not willing to pay this price, we're not going to be received by him. The, he's basically saying the same thing that we saw in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. Remember? Either be hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. If you're not willing to pay this price, you can't be his disciple. If you as salt have become tasteless, there's no way to season you. It's useless and will be thrown out. We have to be willing to pay this price if we're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's suppose for a moment that you're not willing to pay this price. Ask yourself, is it really worth what you might gain by not following Jesus Christ? Well, you know it isn't. Because Jesus says in Matthew 16, verses 26 to 27, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? and forfeits his soul. To gain the world, you must forfeit your soul. What is it going to profit you to gain the world for the short period of time, but then have to give up eternity? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Paul tells us that if we persist in seeking for glory and honor and immortality, he's going to give us eternal life. But if we seek after the things of the world, he's going to give us what our sins deserve. If you're not willing to live for Christ, but you want to embrace the world instead, you might have fun for a season. But afterwards, Jesus says, it's going to cost you your soul. Is it worth it? To escape hell and to be in heaven forever is worth any price that you might have to pay. Paul says, you must be willing to suffer persecution. Verse 12, 2 Timothy 3, 
Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And don't forget, only those who live godly in Christ Jesus are going to see heaven. So you have to be willing to be persecuted if you're going to see heaven. Are you willing to pay that price? If you want to see heaven, that's the price you have to pay. And let me just add, if there's any hope that our Lord's kingdom is going to advance in this world, we all have to be willing to pay this price. Otherwise, the word's not going to get out. The kingdom of heaven isn't going to advance. So may God give all of us the grace that we need to be willing to stand up for him even though it means there is this price to be paid. And may he even change our thinking to the point where we come down on it like the Apostle Paul. Not only does he not resent the fact that he was beaten and bruised and scarred for Christ, he even gloried in it. He, he saw them again as the marks, the brand marks of Christ, his marks of ownership, and the fact that the Lord was pleased with him because he was willing to stand in his place and suffer that persecution. May the Lord give us such a heart. Let's, let's bow in a few moments of prayer and ask the Lord to apply his word to our lives and to make us like this.